Hey everybody, uh, welcome to Perm Permanente Docs Chat. I'm Doc McDonald and thanks for joining today. We're a little bit late, I apologize for some technical snafus, but hey, it is what it is. Uh, today, I'm really excited for our, our guest, uh, Dr. Jason Braley is the medical director of sports medicine at the Permanente Medical Group up in the, based out of Sacramento. Um, and so we're gonna talk about uh, um, athlete, athletics and athletes and, and a little bit about mental health and some of his, his um, work up there as well too. So if you have questions, Feel free to drop them in the chat if you're on if you're on Zoom, if you're on Facebook, please please drop them in the questions, uh, excuse me, in the comments, and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can as well, too. So without further ado, we're gonna keep this high yield and, and just jump right in. So, Dr. Braley, thank you so much for joining us. Um, tell us, tell us who you are and, and what you do. Alex, thanks very much for having me today. It's honestly, it's a privilege to be here today. Um, so my background, I'm actually entering into my 10th year with uh, TPMG up here in Northern California. I'm actually a Southern California guy. I was raised down there in the Inland, Inland Empire. So it's nice to, again, connect with my Southern colleagues today. Um, I went to medical school at Loma Linda University. I ended up doing family medicine residency with the Navy, was uh, down in San Diego for about three years. Um, did some payback time after my residency was done and um, had an interest in sports medicine. So at the end of my military time, figured out I wanted to do that next. I uh, was able to get a little exposure in the military with, uh, you know, the, the athletes that they are. And I think it just sort of set the stage for where we are next. So um, worked up in Seattle for a few years, about five years after I got out of fellowship in 2008. And then uh, just just couldn't, you know, miss California. So had this opportunity to show up and um, here we are. The rest is history. Awesome. Wonderful. And, and tell us a little bit about your role in, uh, in TPMG and the sports medicine uh, uh, director in that role there. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's been a lot of fun. It's really been an evolution. And I think, um, you know, I, I, I was fortunate enough to come at a time when there had been a well-established sports medicine department in Elk Grove. And um, those primary care sports providers had great relationships with the orthopedic surgeons in that area. When we partnered with the Sacramento Kings back in 2013, we saw the service line expand locally and were able to create a space within the arena where the Kings practice and play. And so that kind of blossomed from there. And then we had other partnerships that evolved with the Golden State Warriors, the San Jose Sharks. San Jose Sharks was actually number two. And um, throughout that time, it basically was just sort of an extension of what had been going on in multiple locations. And then multiple pieces of the puzzle came together to where we could really align and collaborate across multiple specialties. So as, as you well know, I think sports medicine is a giant Venn diagram. There's the primary care side of sports. There's the orthopedic surgery side. There's physical therapy. There's neuropsychology. There's psychology. All these tangents come together. And, uh, you know, we're still working to, to do things in manners that optimizes care delivery, but it's just been a fun progress. So I've been able to be uh, intimately involved with that and work with other leaders in orthopedic surgery and other departments as we continue to grow. Yeah, that's, a, that's amazing. And, and talk about sort of a wraparound uh, patient, patient centered uh, department. And I guess full disclosure, as everyone knows, or this, I, I practice sports medicine and I'm a family medicine trained as well, too. So uh, primary care sports medicine is something I'm really passionate about and really putting the, the athlete at the center of all the work we do. Um, it's interesting. You, you, I want to ask you a little bit more about your time in the Navy and how that influenced your decision to go into sports medicine specifically. And, you know, I, I, I think of, you know, we have our, our high level elite athletes. And then we also have almost what I consider our, our industrial athletes, you know, people who work in warehouses, people who work construction, who use their bodies as part of their job. Um, and, and I think there's a lot of overlap there. And when people think sports medicine, they automatically start thinking about kind of the sexy part, right? The, mm -hmm. the, the professional yeah. athletes and things like that. Um, but also, you know, a lot of people are in the Navy are, are you know, industrial athletes, if you will, sure. um, even if they're not sort of on the, on the Navy football team, if you will. Yeah, no, for sure. And I, I actually, you know, in, in full disclosure, I, I think um, it was really a whole bunch of pieces that came together when I was at Camp Pendleton. Um, you know, I, I rotated out with the sports med docs in the military and, and a lot of what they were seeing were people that either came into the service not prepared. So mm -hmm. their bodies weren't prepared for the use that they had to do in boot camp or some of the training evolutions or they were hurt during routine, you know, practice and training. And so um, you're right, it was kind of like a mix of this is from their job, but at the same time, their job may be very athletic. Yeah. Uh, down in the San Diego area, there were some docs that were covering the Ironman half uh, or the half Ironman. So I had an opportunity to participate in that a little bit. 
Um, yeah, my full disclosure is that I actually had been part of the GI Bill and um, I was going to do a, a master's in exercise physiology because I've always sort of thought that was cool. But then um, it took me about two months to kind of figure out that would be really hard to, to tie in with a, a, a physician career, right? So sure. that's when it kind of became evident that the fellowship was sort of the right way to bring that all together. But yeah, you're exactly right. I mean, I think it's just that that's what's cool about sports medicine is that there's a, a big spectrum of patients and ways that they hurt themselves. And how do we help them attain goals? What you know, whatever that may be. Yeah, no, I, that's that's fantastic, and I think we'll we'll have lots to talk about. So we're going to have to try to keep this high yield and not not bore our audience as well. Um, so I, I wanted to um, so so chat a little bit about uh, you, you recently were on the Permanente Medicine podcast talking about sports medicine um, and specifically talking about you know athletes and their mental health as well, which has been a lot uh, kind of a, a, a hot topic recently and, and in the news. And so for those of, those of you who are interested, if you go to permanente.org, um, it's actually linked on the website to, to that podcast. So go check it out. It's a fantastic um, uh, uh, podcast. But, but can you tell us a little bit of, more about, about that aspect of sports medicine and some of those things you guys talked about during the podcast? Sure. Yeah, that was a really fun podcast with Doug Christie, who's had a you know long NBA career and is just a super dynamic guy, one of the assistant coaches out here. And I, you know, I think the the topic of mental health in athletics and sports medicine is again so multifaceted, right? And I think where we've seen it in professional sports are, you know, the the Michael Phelps, the the gymnasts, like these these people that have been dealing with high pressures for years, right? It's very forward facing in public. And I think it's very easy to take a look at those athletes and kind of roll your eyes, right? Like, oh, that must be stressful, right? You're making millions of dollars doing what you, you know? And, and I think that part, you know, it's, it's understandable where people may think that, but I think it's also the understanding that athletes that we aspire to admire sort of where we go to escape our regular lives, they're humans too, right? And I, and I think that's what's, you know, what was so good about this is they were, some of these, some, some high uh, level athletes were willing to talk about that and be open, honest, and vulnerable just to say, you know, these are pressures, right? And I think we've all seen the explosion of social media, right? And just, you know, how do you not internalize some comments that may be made and how does that additive effect? And if you're dealing with injury, if you're, end, if you're dealing with end of career or career transitions, how does that work? So I think that's kind of been the fascinating part too, is just to see that evolve in the public space. And then also see in varying degrees how that's come across in some of our athletes, right? And some athletes are very private and don't want to talk about that. Some people, you know, are open to the idea. And I, I still think there's, we're in this transition phase, right? Where I think mental health, historically, you were seen as weak, right? And I, and I kind of overlap some of that, even with our own training in medicine, right? Like we kind of get used to this hardened approach of what we should yeah. be like. Um, and it's just getting that conversation out there to make sure that um, if there are issues, they're addressed. And, and again, as you well know, like this affects us in all tangents, whether you are a weekend warrior or someone that's just trying to get fit, you know, this stuff comes up. So anyway, I, I think that's what it's just so nice to have that conversation out there. And I think we're, we're doing our best to just get that into the conversation and the care that we're, we're delivering every day. Yeah, I mean, I, I think so, I guess. Uh, I guess I have a couple of disclosures. Uh, one is my wife is a psychiatrist. Uh, and two, you know, I, I actually race as a professional athlete. And when I made that switch from being an amateur uh, triathlete to a professional triathlete, uh, all my friends were like, oh, that's so cool. That's so much fun. I'm like, actually, it's it's more work. And like, you mm -hmm. take anything that you love and you suddenly make it your job and you yep. get to perform to, you know, uh, advance to the next level or to earn an income. And it adds a whole different dynamic, which I think a lot of the public don't necessarily understand um, and don't really appreciate either. And so I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of these athletes uh, for coming forwards and, and speaking about that too, because I, I think, you know, obviously uh, athletics is such an important piece of, uh, of maintaining your, your physical and your mental health, but it's it, like anything, it's a U-shaped curve, right? If you don't have anything, any exercise, you're probably going to have some poor mental health. A little exercise improves your mental health, but then too much almost probably makes your mental health worse or going to add a different, different strain and stress also too. And so how... You know, so I think I think it's really something we all need to be aware of as whether we're weekend warriors or, or, or treating these patients. Um, but tell us more about how you approach an athlete who may be struggling with some mental health issues and whether working as a, with a professional athlete versus maybe a weekend warrior versus someone who maybe works more in, in physical labor, how you approach those individuals from sort of that mental health point of view. Yeah, I have to be super honest that my approach and experience and where I think 
I strive to do this, but you know, that's another topic is how we do better as physicians, right? Mm-hmm. My, my personal philosophy changed probably about five or six years ago when I was actually a patient in physical therapy. And I will never forget this. I was meeting this therapist for the first time on the table. And of course they wanted to know about my issues. What are the symptoms? What are we dealing with? But at the end they said, how's your sleep? And I was like, what the heck is this person asking me about my sleep? Right. And we talked a little bit about that. How's your stress? How's your stress level right now? Um, how's your nutrition? Like those were the three areas that they stopped and asked. And I was like, well, I need to sleep more. Stress has been through the roof. And yeah, I think I eat pretty well, but you know, there's ways we can all improve. So, but the point was what I really loved about that encounter is that the physical therapist talked about research that tied in outcomes in musculoskeletal injury to those factors. Right. And, and I, and I was almost a little bit embarrassed because I was like, okay, well, here I am the primary care background here. I am the guy that's done extra training in sports. Mm -hmm. And it took this experience for me to have somebody else weave this into my care to sort of really open my eyes to it. Right. Cause I think we get so used in our day-to-day lives. Like, okay, are we meeting these standards? Are we getting patients in quick enough? Are we, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, but it was really eye opening, And I think that's what we've been trying to do is introduce that into the discussion to say, all it takes is 30 seconds to ask the question. Mm-hmm. You may not have all the answers right there. And it may, it, it may go one of several ways. You may not need to do anything more, but that person knows you care about that element. And they have a reminder from a physician that those aspects matter, right? The second part is maybe you can provide some experience or some recommendations on the spot that makes the key difference. Or beyond that, maybe you've opened the door to a conversation where they're going to benefit from talking to someone that has a better skill set than you do. Um, so again, I, you know, I, I don't know that we're perfect there, but that's part of our active conversation to say, how do we not neglect this rather than just think about the mechanics of a musculoskeletal or a sports injury? Sounds like you have a fantastic physical therapist. So uh. <laughs> yeah, no, I, like I said, I will never forget it. Cause it truly was like, I was just sort of blown away. I was like, man, I, you know, I'm just, I, I just told him, I was like, I'm just so honored that you asked, right? I mean, it just, just, I was just, like I said, it was just something that wasn't used to. And I just thought it was a great, a, a great way to integrate that. And, and I think it means that it's important also. Um, you know, we, we don't, we don't ask things that aren't important. We're too busy not to. Right. Um, right. And so sometimes even just asking the question sometimes makes that lasting effect, which I think is so important. I mean, that's part of the reason why I went into family medicine first and then, and then did sports fellowship it, it, because I feel like I truly am, am a family doctor at heart, which thinks about the whole patient in its entirety or the whole athlete in their entirety, not just their knee or just their shoulder as well too. Um, sure. And so that's what I love about some of the background that, that, that you and I uh, yeah. share in our training as well. Yeah. Um, Tell us, tell us a little more about, I, mean, I know you have some interest in, in concussion management, I believe, if, if I'm correct in reading your CV, um, and, and tell us about sort of concussion management and also mental health there, because that's such a huge piece of, uh, it, it, I think there's some emerging research there, but that was kind of a big black box when it came to concussion management, is a lot of the subsequent mental health issues that, that come of it based on, sometimes based on the treatment or not based on the treatment as it may be. Yeah, no, I think it's huge. And, and I think what, what's been fun for me in my career, fun, I should probably use that word kind of loosely, right? But I think that, you know, is the, the information around concussion just exploded back sort of in the 2000s. And then mm-hmm. we've now had time to see what has been beneficial versus what has not, you know? And I think concussion is such a tough injury just because of its multifaceted nature and how it's going to, you know, affect, people differently based on their trajectory and type of injury and things of that nature. And I, I think, you know, I've actually had conversations with patients about this where I can think back to the quote unquote old days where we told patients to sit in the room, right? Like turn the lights off, don't do anything fun. Don't talk to anybody and just get better. And, you know, I can, I can literally think of some cases where it sort of goes against that oath that we take about do no harm, right? Like I feel like there were cases where even though we were doing what we thought was right, it probably made that athlete worse, right? Not probably, it did, you know? Yeah. And, and what I really like about what we're learning now is just that as long as we're safe, introducing some of that early cardiovascular exercise early and trying to incorporate normal environment into their day-to-day life. And of course, you know, like on the professional side, the league has been very, very proactive about doing that. And those athletes are different, you know, based on their more mature adult status versus some of the adolescents that sometimes have different challenges. But I I think it does factor in, like we just know that people with mood disorders are higher risk for prolonged recovery. Um, You know, and so again, to your point, that U-shaped curve, if you can somehow integrate 
that, that right dose. And I'll actually talk about exercise as a, this is a medication for you. This is a prescription. It has to be used with caution, just like anything. And it can have too low of a dose or too high of a dose. Right. And I think that's where it really ties back into the, to where we are with concussion. Yeah. I, I, I could not agree more. And I, I always think that, that sometimes by pulling an athlete out of there and by a lot of times athletes, you know, their, their identity is wrapped up in their sport, especially as a teenager, or if they're really trying to pursue a high level. And if we, if we pull them away from that sport, um, it, it just can make things so much worse. And, and I, I've often found that keeping people involved and working on the sidelines or helping out in some way when they do get a concussion is so beneficial just to having that athlete stay connected with the team, uh, be, be, be it, you know, physically or just emotionally, I guess, to help avoid a lot of those mood disorders, which can result in uh, over treatment of concussions. Quite yeah, frankly. absolutely. Yeah. Completely yeah. agree. Awesome. Um, tell us, tell us a little bit about more about the Kaiser Permanente Sports Medicine Centers in Northern California. And I, I guess I have to, I have to tell you, I'm a little bit jealous. Um, our, our sports medicine in Southern California is not uh, um, contained, uh, it, it structured in the same way as Northern California. So I'm a member, my sports clinics are actually part of the family medicine department in other areas as part of the ortho department. Um, there's not sort of a standalone uh, sports medicine uh, a, a division or department um, here in Southern California. But tell us more about the, the sports medicine center in, in TPMG and some of your work there and how sure. that structure has really benefited yeah. uh, the, the patients and the organization as a whole. Sure. Yeah. So I, I have to say, too, we have different locations that have different models. And I think part of us is that, you know, the number of med centers that we had, there are different ways it's worked well. So, of course, we're just trying to find what works best in all locations. And I think the overarching message is no matter whether you have primary care sports docs embedded in orthopedic surgery, that we're talking about these factors that cross it, that go across the lines, right? So some of the issues that orthopedic surgeons may not um, have been trained in or sort of think about in their in their technical expertise, right? That, that's where the value lies, no matter what your building looks like, right? So I think for me, again, I, I, I totally get it. I, I'm spoiled, like, let's just be honest, you know, the, the issue for us just came up uh, with the, the new arena being built and some space that was available. It was an opportunity for us to, uh, create a space as exists elsewhere. And uh, the location I did my fellowship in Cleveland, they had done something very similar with Cleveland Clinic Sports Health. It was an integrated center near their practice facility for basketball. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it was just a great opportunity to do that. And um, we have um, a team of physical therapists and two athletic trainers that are the rehab portion of our team with our uh, sports medicine physicians. We also, I think one of the key pieces of our location here in downtown Sacramento is having a neuropsychologist with us, Dr. Don Levine. So she has been instrumental in creating a new paradigm as it relates to helping the sports physicians with the, the complex cases and integrating the school and the mental health part. That's been really, really great. So above and beyond that, I think we will see as we continue to grow and there's, you know, there's, there's possibly new hospitals coming and the integration with orthopedic surgery in, in our space may happen at some point. Um, so we have a lot of different directions to go. And, and again, I think I was just lucky, right time, right place. Um, you know, we're hoping to see the Kings do uh, uh, better next year and, and um, you know, uh, advance into the playoffs. And, you know, yeah, we've just had the opportunity in other spaces with Golden State. They also had a new facility very close to where the Chase Center was being built. So they've had a model very similar to ours. So uh, again, it's just been great because I think patients like having the ability to see a physician, understand what's going on in the next phase for rehab. And we have that open door, direct communication back and forth. So uh, hoping to see more of it. We're hoping that we can set the stage for others off of which to build. But like I said, we also realize that we have a very good thing going uh, where we are. That's, uh, that's phenomenal. And you kind of already touched on some of my, I was going to ask again a little bit about your role as, the, as, a, as a team physician for the Sacramento Kings, which you sort of touched on a little bit. I guess I should, another disclosure, I'm a Clippers fan, um, but you know, so. It, yeah, fair, that's good. It's all it's, good. It's, all, it's about being active, right? About, I don't tell about, anybody that I was a Lakers fan when I grew up. Like I, I don't tell anybody, so don't let anyone know that. But I imagine that would get you like people chasing down the street in Sacramento. Exactly. With that, yeah, so, you know, exactly. Yeah. Um, but that, that's fantastic. And it's such a, it's so great to see that, 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 Kaiser Permanente and the NBA have, has formed this partnership and, and really been able to help provide, you know, care. And, and again, I, again, I'm biased. I think the team physician should really be a sports medicine and family medicine or a primary care doctor, really, because that's ultimately, and then when you need the orthopedic surgeons and that technical expertise, that's kind of where you go to. I feel like the model of having the orthopedist being the team doctor, it, you're missing a lot of those other pieces 
uh, which is really primary care on uh, primary care sports medicine. But again, I, I digress as well. Too. No, no, I get it. And I think this also speaks about just the, the, the permanent medicine model, right? Because I feel like what's been nice in our role is that there's a mutual respect across different service lines, right? And I think as we've come in as team physicians, we've had that um, sort of that lateral conversation that I think is beneficial for the patients. And to your point, I think that was kind of old school sports medicine, but as we've seen these other areas expand, you realize how important they are, you know? And I, I think that's one of been one of, it's been one of the most enjoyable parts for me is when you have those days where, you know, you get to go cover this game or be part of this, um, the, this, this league, but you've also got those kids that don't have means and don't have resources and you're able to have the same conversation, you know, and sort of, thinking about this mental health part, I think that's been one thing that's huge for us is that you realize in sports medicine that sometimes their mental health needs may only come up in context of their athletic injury mm -hmm. or whatever happened at school and PE class and all that kind of stuff. Right. So yeah. I think that's, what's really cool about that, that involvement, number one, but then number two, just where we see the importance of different levels and how it all weaves back together. Yeah. I completely agree. Fantastic. This is wonderful. We could go on and on and on, but we unfortunately need to wrap up. Uh, so last question, uh, tell us what makes you most proud to be a permanent day physician. Yeah, it's a great question. I, I think maybe I read your mind and I answered it a little bit already. No, I, I just, you know, um, having, having come into the system after been, being in practice for about five years in a big PPO model, um, one of the things I just can't emphasize enough that I think makes me proud, but also just such a great system to work for is just the colleagues that I have to work with and how easily it is to communicate with them, right? I remember when I came here and I got my iPhone and they gave me this app and it had the list of who was on call and their names. And, it, and I'm like, what, what, right? Yeah. Now, granted that's technology, you know, but I, I mean, it's just amazing how you use technology to integrate with each other, have mm -hmm. clear communication rapidly. And that really benefits the patient, right? They're not they're not sent out to some other private consultant and you're waiting for weeks to find out what to do next. So I, I think it's really those factors that make me most proud. And I also think that our model in this current national difficulty with healthcare, it makes sense, right? And so I just sort of feel like where I'm at makes most sense for what my training is, the kind of care I wanna deliver and the collegial collaboration with my peers. That's really what matters most. That's amazing, awesome. Well, I Thank you so much, Dr. Brilli, for joining us. Really appreciate your time and all your work up there. I'm gonna to have to come up there and, and knock on the, Please do. The, the, the med center door next time I'm, yeah. up, I'm up in Sacramento uh, and, and bother you, but I've heard this, the facility there, it's absolutely amazing. So thank you so much for joining. I really appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Have a great day. Appreciate it. You too. Bye-bye.